41% shooting last year. You know, New York Knicks, a 17-game drop in the win column. What on earth happened to the Knicks, and what on earth happened to you? Uh, I mean, for one, it was unacceptable the whole year. Uh, I'm not going to take make any excuses for myself. Uh, come, but coming after these surgeries is a tough thing to come back from. I didn't expect to be at that top tier to where I was. Uh, we had a lot of confusion going on on what we we're going to do as far as, you know, the schemes and stuff like that. And some people didn't agree with it and other people d didn't agree with it. So it just caused confusion. Then before you know it, people doing what they want to do. Some people doing what they want to do. And Speak up. We can't hear, they can't hear you there. Speak up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just a lot of confusion. You know, we just didn't agree. Uh, we, we agreed to disagree a lot of times. And that's everybody knows in, in order for five guys to be on the same page like the Spurs were and move the ball and do all the exceptionally well things that they did you, to win, uh, that's what it takes. And you, everybody has to be on the same page. We weren't. I was critical of you last year, and it actually hurt me to do it because JR and I have known each other for many years, and I got a lot of love for him. But I felt last year, you know, when Mike Woodson was there, he was somebody that was seen as really, really being a supporter of yours. And yet, whether it was getting suspended early, whether it was coming back, not necessarily playing well, to some of the antics, the, even though I think the untying of the shoelace was made, it was much ado about nothing. People were looking at J.R. Smith and they were saying, he's not focused, he's not into it. What was going on with you last year in terms of your level of focus with the New York Knicks? Uh, I mean, earlier on, I put so much pressure on myself to come back, and, uh, especially after suspension, and then after being hurt. And, to be back where I was the year before, uh, reigning six man. But after that, I put so much pressure on myself from us not starting off well, I'm, uh, I'm expecting us to do a lot better than what we, we were doing. Uh, to try to take some of the pressure off, just have fun with the game. That's where the shoe incident came into play. And just try to ease the tension a little bit, and it wasn't working. None of the, none of the things I had going on in my mind was working. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, it was just so happened, I believe, to be the worst uh, year I've had in, in, in the NBA, uh, including my rookie year. So uh, I'm just looking to bounce back. Would you have blamed Phil Jackson and the Knicks if they had traded you? No, absolutely not. I mean, the way I was playing, I was playing like a person who didn't want to be there, playing, uh, not looking as focused as a person who, you know, should be uh, in the situation that we were, in the trenches that we were, and uh, I, couldn't, I wouldn't blame them at all. How much were... Tyson Chandler, and we both have great respect for him, but Tyson and Raymond Felton, how much were they a part of the chemistry issues that your team had? Uh, I mean, whenever you have a, I mean, your point guard and your, you know, your leading defender, uh, I mean, a lot of pick and roll situations we, we weren't agreeing on, and, and I mean, that, that right there will kill you in the zone. I mean, that's the toughest yep. play to guard in basketball. So, uh, I mean, they were a part of it, but I can't blame that on them because there was another three people out there on the court. There were people that looked at Tyson Chandler, who's now a member of the Dallas Mavericks because he got traded, and they accused him of quitting on the team. I don't believe that. I don't think Ty Tyson Chandler has a quitting bone in his body. But I do believe he was so frustrated that ultimately he acted out of character, and he, in, in, because of his frustration, ended up being a distraction to the New York Knicks last year in some part. Is that an accurate or fair thing to say? Um, yeah, somewhat, but a lot of people, a lot of people don't know. Uh, I mean, Tyson was going through a lot of things with his mother at the time too at the wow. end of the season. So, I mean, with her health I didn't and know all that, that yeah. stuff like that, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to focus. I know if I was going through that with my mother, I wouldn't be able to focus on basketball or anything else. So, uh, to his defense, he had a, he had so much going on, and absolutely frustration got the best of all of us. I think so. Uh, I can't just pinpoint that on Tyson. Well, you were coming off the injury after being the sixth man of the year, and obviously you said you weren't yourself. You just told us about Tyson Chandler. He obviously wasn't himself. Raymond Felton clearly wasn't himself, as we learned, and I'll leave it at that, but that wasn't his fault. I'm going to blame somebody else, but we're on national TV. I'm going to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Here's my point. Mm -hmm. With all of those distractions, how fair was it that Mike Woodson ended up taking the heat? I, don't, I mean, I'm, I've been saying this from day one. I don't think it's, I don't think it's his fault at all. Uh, if anything, you know, we go out there and play. We, we have an obligation to go out there and play to the best of our ability with the most focused and, and intensity that we, we can. And we obviously didn't do that. So I, can, I can't blame that on Woody. Woody did, I think Woody did a good job. 
he would try to reach reach out to his players as much as he could, try to, you know, tap into it mentally, try to get the best out of them, and uh, it just wasn't working. So how surprised were you that Melo did re-sign? Um, honestly, I, was, I wasn't too surprised, but I didn't want to get over-anxious about it. You know, I've been in this situation with Melo before in Denver, and... Uh, just knowing the type of person and player he is, I didn't, I didn't talk to him about it not once, uh, mm. not one time. Because, you know, and when he first left Denver to come here, I mean, I was talking to him about it every day. And mm. before I, before I knew it, I got so wrapped up into it, uh, I was looking at him different from just reading different stuff and stuff like that. So I just wanted to let him make his own decision and uh, do what's best for him and his family. Have you and, talked to him since? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And. It's ever, and we're in a great place. Uh, Melo is obviously the biggest piece to this puzzle that we got going on, and uh, we, the ship doesn't move without him. He's the captain of the boat, and uh, we're just uh, other guys trying to turn up machine. Like I said, even though you were the second leading scorer on the team, I believe in your skills, bro. I know what you can do. I appreciate and, it. And that wasn't you last year. Did yeah. you look at Melo and talk to him and say, I got some making up to do? Did you uh, tell him that? I tell him that all the time. We're, we're, we're in the gym. I mean, we've been in the gym two days a week since April. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, two a day since April. So mm -hmm. this is, we're, we're due. We're long overdue. Yeah. Okay, early feel for Derek Fisher as your new coach. I love Derek. You know, I've I'm, I'm known Derek since my rookie year when I played in, uh, out in Long Beach. It's so, like, so long ago. Um, Ever since, since the first day I met him to now, he's been the same person. He's probably one of the most consistent, professional people I've ever met around this business. And uh, I can't wait to play for him.